Okay, so um, first I want to thank everyone again for joining. And today we have four great speakers with us to get the conversation going. I'm just going to do a quick introduction and then you'll hear from them a little bit more uh, once I go through a few slides about, about our team. So we have Matt Hoffman, who's the managing partner at Housing Tech Ventures, who just led the startup zone at IBS. We have Abby Ivory, who's the managing director of Ivory Innovations, which is catalyzing high impact innovations in the housing affordability. We also have Julieta Moraday, I hope I pronounced that correct, um, partner at Home Team Ventures, who's investing in early stage founders and technology to drive affordability and speed in home construction. And then last but not least, we have Tim Seams, who's the director of building products intelligence with John Burns Real Estate Consulting, who's leveraging key solutions on issues for building products and housing. So before we get started, I just wanna give a, a brief understanding of what we're all about. The Housing Innovation Alliance is a nationwide community of game changers focused on driving innovation in the housing industry. We identify and prioritize key innovations happening throughout the marketplace by creating conversations, capturing key insights and making connections in our community to help drive your business forward. So when it comes to the future of housing, we are asking the question, how will the housing industry evolve over the next three years and what major changes are on the horizon for the next 10? So to get that conversation started, um, you'll be hearing from our speakers. So on that note, I'm gonna turn the floor over to our speakers that we have today. Um, and Matt, you are up first, so go ahead and take it away. Great, good afternoon, good morning uh, to everyone. A pleasure to be here. I'm Matt Hoffman from Housing Tech Ventures. Thanks to the Alliance and Dennis and Betsy and Paige for having me here today. Delighted to participate in this. Um, we are going to be talking today, uh, both the speakers uh, who follow me and then when we go into the breakout rooms about our priorities for innovation in 2021. So I thought I'd start uh, by sharing mine uh, and then talking a little bit about the uh, experience uh, at IBS this year uh, before passing it off uh, to my fellow panelists. Uh, just a little background. I started um, Housing Tech Ventures uh, in 2018. Uh, my background uh, was in, in housing has been for, I've been in the housing sector for about 20 years now. I started off uh, doing infill development in Baltimore, uh, started my own development company and really got to know all aspects of the business uh, before uh, switching over to the affordable housing sector and really focusing on how we could increase housing affordability in the country uh, through new and innovative approaches and in construction, finance, uh, policy making. And uh, what really evolved for me over that time period was that our industry, the, the housing building, housing sector writ large, has a very sophisticated policy and regulatory structure, sophisticated uh, financing, uh, which has evolved Im immensely, especially over the last 40 years or so of formal uh, community development and affordable housing practice that's emerged in this country. What has not kept pace is the, uh, the, the, the market side of the business, the production side of the business. And that really led me to found a Housing Tech Ventures to provide capital as well as, as advisory to companies with emerging solutions that can increase housing affordability, availability, and attainability on the market side uh, without subsidy, without requirement or regulation. Uh, so that's my, my current focus. And I, I put my four priorities for 2021 uh, in, the, in the context of that, that objective, uh, which is really to increase productivity on the supply side uh, and, and reduce the affordability crisis. The context though, that we have to do that in now, as opposed to say 10 or 12 years ago, when, when we were really addressing the, the, uh, the set of issues that, that confront us that challenge housing affordability is, is, is the climate uh, change remediation that we have to do. We knew it was there a decade ago. Uh, for many, it was a priority, but it really did not rise to the bar that we currently have today. And especially with the new administration that has come uh, in in this past month, uh, it's clear that everything is gonna be running through a climate change filter. So that adds an additional set of, of 
constraints really uh, to how we, we build because we know that, that the built environment has a direct effect, a huge effect uh, on our climate. Um, the second uh, element here, which is, is kind of new and different for those of us that are working uh, on the affordability side of, of housing uh, is frankly COVID. Um, it really uh, has changed the housing market. I'm sure that many of you that live in, um, in, in, in suburban areas have seen the housing costs increase uh, just through market pressure. Again, it's a supply and demand issue. Um, so that's, that's changed some of the context as well for, for some of the solutions we're developing. So in terms of what I'm looking, what I'm pri prioritizing for, for 2021 uh, with regard to innovation in the housing sector that can lead to affordability, First and foremost, um, we have such a diverse and, and fragmented housing value chain, the bulk of which is made up um, of, by small and mid-sized companies. There are between four and 500,000 companies in the housing production sector that are less than five employees. Um, so they just don't have the resources necessarily to adopt innovation at the pace that, that, that we need um, innovation to be um, implemented. Um, so I think that that's, that's something that we as a sector need to figure out how to do better. Part of it is through industry alliances like, like this one, um, and just really trying to help these small companies uh, adapt innovation, whether that's technology or, um, or other methodologies that, that will increase productivity. The second priority that I'm focused on is making sure that governments at all levels um, are adopting a prop tech mindset. And by that, I mean, just recognizing that even though housing is, is, is a physical um, uh, element or practice, um, our sector really needs to become much more, more digitized. And a lot of that is how we access data. The data that we access, which a lot of it comes out of um, uh, the Census Bureau, um, is often backwards looking to an extent where it's almost useless. Um, so one of the big challenges I think is, is for uh, governments at all levels, federal, state and local to provide this sector with much better data, reduce regulations that are outmoded and allow for more uh, innovation, which may not be allowed um, technically under existing regulations, but providing some sort of safe harbor for people that are striving to meet goals that align with the public policy objectives. The third priority um, that I'm focused on is, is modular. Um, modular, everyone is talking about it. Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot more activity and startups uh, addressing it. But one of the big barriers that I, I'm seeing is, um, is uh, companies that are preparing to produce modular but don't have the factory or access to a factory where the, the price point and the transportation costs make sense. So there's a real need, I believe, for a much more regionalized approach to, uh, to factories uh, that can, um, can serve uh, builders who want to produce modular but don't have uh, factories in their regions. And on the finance side, um, it's still it's, it's a very new uh, form of construction for traditional lenders and investors and insurers and, and trying to familiarize them with um, with, with, with modular and get them comfortable so that they can um, have finance products that, that meet the needs uh, of those that are doing modular production. And then the final priority um, is around capital formation. Again, seeing a lot of early stage companies that are kind of hybrids between um, uh, traditional developers and some sort of system systematized development uh, and so they're not quite real estate project finance and they're not quite venture capital and they're struggling to find investors uh, who have become habituated to either one of those two, two models and they're sitting right in between. So I, I, I think that this is something that we're gonna see emerge and hopefully will emerge uh, in the next year or so where there's much more capital available for people that are experimenting with new types of, of housing forms. So those are my priorities. And I just invite you now, before we get to the next panelist, to start thinking about your priorities, because that's going to be the opening question for uh, our breakout session. So I'm going to give you a very quick overview in two minutes or less on uh, the International Builders Show, which wrapped up last week. I saw on our poll that about a third of the folks on this call were, were there. Um, 
there were some struggles with the technology platform. So depending on when you tried to access, I'm not sure how much you've got to see. We did something different this year. I was um, asked to curate a uh, startup zone for the International Builder Show where we asked early stage companies to come and present uh, their solutions for the building market. We selected nine out of dozens of applicants. Uh, and these are those companies very quickly. They represent kind of the, not the full range, but a good range across the housing value chain from, and I'm just gonna work very quickly because I want you to uh, get to the deeper discussion, but these, in fact, I won't go through each one of them, but they're here on the slides. You're gonna need a copy of these slides. I suggest that you um, uh, just do a quick link through each one of these. Uh, some of them are building products, some of them are data products. The ones in the lower, at the bottom and the lower right-hand corner are products that enable uh, developers to have better communications uh, with their with their field workers. So uh, these are the types of innovations that we see emerging, better connections between the home office and the field, new types of, of, of products that enable uh, buildings to be put up faster uh, and better analytics. So I'm gonna pause there and pass the baton off to one of my fellow panelists. I look forward to seeing the rest of you in the breakout room. So Hi, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Um, we love working with Matt, and Matt actually has helped us um, do a lot of the things that we're doing, and we look and work with, um, or look at and work with a lot of the same companies, so it's really fun. Um, so just brief intro to who we are. Um, I am the managing director of a group called Ivory Innovations. Um, we started about three years ago, and um, I, my personal background is in impact investing, and my dad... Um, runs actually the largest home builder in the state of Utah. And as we were investing, you know, all over the world, my dad kind of came in and said, hey, housing affordability is a huge problem domestically. Let's find the best way to um, invest in that. And we started doing a bunch of research and Ivory Innovations was kind of born out of that. We pulled in um, a lot of fabulous um, academics who I'm sure you all know, like Carol Galante and Chris Herbert and, and a lot of people who um, really understand the issue very well. And they helped us um, form what is now the Ivory Prize, which is a subset of Ivory Innovations. And the Ivory Prize, um, essentially what we do with that is we um, look for different innovations from across the country. We have three different issue areas where we look at um, those being construction and design, uh, financial innovation, and then public policy and regulatory reform. Um, and so every year we use the price structure instead of an investment structure because we're able to um, see or look at both nonprofit and for-profit companies. Um, and then we also look at government entities. And so it allows us to kind of see the broad picture um, of everything that's going on in this world that's circled around housing affordability. And so we're very focused on that. Um, most of the innovations that we look at are targeting the median income earner, um, how we can make housing more attainable for them. And uh, especially because they're being priced out of the market right now, as you all know very well. And then um, they don't have as much opportunity for government subsidy or, or different um, options in that area. And so we typically focus on companies there. Um, every year we have about 150 uh, companies come through. This year we just closed our application process, had about 160 um, companies come through actually from 39 states. So we've been growing uh, over the past couple of years. And it's been really fun to see um, the new innovations that are coming online. Um, so that's kind of one thing that we focus on. Uh, we're also based at the University of Utah and we, um, we have a focus for students. And so we, we really wanna make sure that students are educated on this issue, um, that they are, you know, becoming the solutioneers, they're becoming the next entrepreneurs, that they're um, really finding a way to do this. And one of the programs that we run for that is a program called Hack House. Um, and so that's like a 24 hour brainstorming challenge. And we bring students in, they have 24 hours to think of a, um, you know, idea of how they can solve housing affordability. And then we'll kind of give out prize money and everything else. But the, the best part about that was that we've been running it for a couple of years and we've had about four companies started by students uh, coming out of that and one really solid one actually coming from this last fall. And um, it's a fun way to watch students start moving towards um, this innovation. So that um, is a brief 
you know, background on who we are. Um, the next slide flips into some of the, the trends that we see. Um, and so we wrote, or I wrote an article with Kent Colton, who's um, on our advisory board for the Stanford Social Innovation Review. And we addressed um, some of the pathways to innovation uh, and affordability in housing that we've seen through this prize process. And so, um, I mean, I can go into all of these, but I won't because you can see them on the slide. But it's interesting because as we go through this, we see a lot of companies um, and governments coming through and they're addressing these issues. And, and I will just address maybe the first one as we're on here. And that would just be this removal of regulatory barriers um, that I, the more I am in housing, the more I know that this is such a, um, a difficult issue for everyone um, who's trying to come up with solutions and innovations in this space. And we are so primed um, we're at a point where like this industry just needs innovation and, uh, you know, it's hard to, to get it to happen because there are a lot of different issues with financing. There are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of resistance coming from government, coming from, um, a lot of different angles. And so what we're trying to help do is break down some of these barriers, uh, support the companies that are breaking down these barriers. And, um, we end up investing in a lot of these companies, uh, helping grant money to the companies that are doing things. And then, uh, with government organizations, we spend a lot of time, um, working with specific governments on legislation that they've passed and helping connect them with uh, governments that are trying to implement similar innovation and, and need ideas and everything else. And so we're all about um, expanding this and making sure that housing becomes more affordable for the overall population over time. Um, we're hoping that we can take a small, a small chunk out of the problem. And so that's really a summary of what we're doing. And I'm happy to talk about any of these things more when we hop into um the breakout session so thanks and i think julietta is up next i am thank you abby um i actually got to meet abby through the ivory prize so absolutely love what you're doing and very excited to be on the panel with you um so i'm actually going to talk first about how home team venture started in the middle of the pandemic in august of 2020 we actually are a spinoff from a nonprofit called new story charity so if you look up new story charity what we're really known is as a housing nonprofit that started through y combinator focused on construction innovation in the housing space. And so what we've been doing over the past five years as a nonprofit with New Story is partnering with federal governments all over Central and South America to build housing units using construction tech. So what's really exciting is that every single time we would build a community with New Story, it almost became like a sandbox for innovation for us because we would partner with the government and build an affordable housing community with about 500 homes but we always partner with a research and development partner to bring in their innovation into the housing space. So an example of that is when we invested in Icon, which is now the leader in 3D printing. But the very first time that we used this innovation, 3D printing in history was for housing. And so we did that, we duplicated this model over and over again in every single one of our communities. I was heading the research and development team, my background's in architecture and structural engineering. So what I was doing is forming a lot of partnerships with early stage startups and academic partners, industry leaders that had these amazing innovations in construction, but they were sitting on a shelf. They weren't being implemented. And what we realized is one of the biggest barriers in construction is that to do proof of concepts, to actually prototype that very first innovation is very capital intensive. So it's hard to be doing a prototype of a home every single time you wanna try a new innovation. And so by doing this in a developing country with lower barriers, we're able to actually pilot much quicker. And so our best case study was when we invested in ICON as a nonprofit, and we realized that we were able to truly do a double bottom line approach. So if you go into the next slide, you'll see really our theory of how we do this with Home Team Ventures. So Home Team Ventures is now a spinoff of the R&D program of New Story, where we've become a for-profit venture capital fund, which is double bottom line, so that we could invest in a lot of these early stage startups in construction tech, and we have a mechanism to do this. We now have a vehicle to actually invest in them by starting this fund. And so we're continuing to invest in these early stage startups in construction tech that have a double bottom line approach. So on one end, we wanna grow their business exponentially like we did with ICON, but at the same time, we wanna have true impact by bringing in these innovators in the housing space, in the social housing space. And so what we're looking at and what we're targeting is any kind of construction innovation that's solving three major issues that we see in the housing space. So as home builders ourselves, by actually building communities, we understood what the biggest barriers are 
in the affordable housing space, which is one, and the most important, the cost of housing is much too high. To actually house all the people that we need to, it's impossible to with the current housing cost. Two is the speed at which we're building. We need to be building much quicker. And then three is quality assurance, quality control and sustainability. And so we're continuing to do this now with home team ventures and any kind of construction tech that's in material science, hardware, software, fintech, prop tech. So we're truly now just having a different kind of vehicle to be bringing in these R&D partners in our space. And if you go into the next slide, now that you understand who we are, I want to address exactly why we're doing what we're doing. So there's a huge opportunity right now in the construction space because the construction industry as a whole is one of the least digitized sectors globally, although it represents one of the biggest markets in the world with 13% of its global GDP. So McKinsey did this great report where they were showing every single industry vertical, and I'm sure everyone on this call knows that construction is at the very bottom, right above farming for least digitized. It only invests about 0.5% of its value into R&D compared to other industry sectors that invest usually five to 6% of its value into R&D, into innovation to continuously improve the sector. And so we know there's a major opportunity to bring in more innovation. Like Abby was saying, she's been in the space for a long time in housing and we desperately need more innovation in the space. And if you go into the next slide, we're looking at it from a lens of housing. So we know that the construction sector being incredibly undigitized is directly impacting the housing sector. And we also know that today there's 1.6 billion people in the world who are homeless. And the UN is projecting this number to increase to 3 billion by 2030. And that's in less than nine years. We're gonna have 3 billion people that are homeless. And if you go into the next slide, you'll see truly what the impact of lowering housing costs has on the homelessness community, which is that if we start lowering and chipping away housing costs across the construction value chain, we're of course providing a lot more supply. So we did an in-depth research to look at Central and South America and the countries that we work in to see if we were to lower the housing costs, which is on average in developing countries about $45,000 per unit. If we were to lower that to $10,000 by bringing in construction innovations, lowering certain parts of the construction value chain, how many more people would have access to housing? So anyone that has access to the, the slide deck, which you will after the presentation, I really urge you to look more into this map and this is scalable across the entire globe in terms of, of course, if we bring down housing costs, we're providing a lot more supply. So if you go into our next slide, this is truly our theory of change, which is that our number one goal with Home Team Ventures is to invest in construction technologies that are lowering the cost of housing. So the way that we're thinking about this is in, over the entire construction value chain, if we look at every single bucket individually, can we find innovators in the space that are specifically lowering the cost of construction in that bucket? So an example is the very first one you see here, which is Airworks, and they're doing aerial land mapping using drone footage. So this is something that lowers construction cost and is a lot more efficient with time for any construction project, whether it's a high rise, a bridge, an infrastructure project. But we know that for housing, serving is a major pain point that we've felt over any community that we've built. So we're trying to, again, find these technologists, find these innovators that are lowering construction costs and bringing them into the area of housing. And if you go into the next slide, you could find our contact information if you are interested um, as a founder of a startup in connecting with us or as a potential LP in investing in our fund. And our top priorities, again, are number one, finding innovators in the space of construction tech to bring them into the housing space, lowering cost of housing ultimately. And two, creating an ecosystem of more developers, more contractors that are adopting construction innovation. We don't have a lack of supply of innovation. What we have is a lack of adoption of governments, of NGOs, nonprofits, and developers in affordable housing that are actually bringing in these innovations into their projects. So I'm really excited to be talking more about that during the breakout sessions. And I believe Tim is next. Yeah, that he is. <laughs> Hello everyone from the Treehouse here in Washington State. I'm glad to be here with Julieta, uh, Abby, Matt, and you all. So thanks for joining. I work on the building products team here at John Burns uh, Consulting, and I've been in building products supply and distribution and product management uh, for about 30 years along with the trades. And my priority uh, for the coming years is helping developers and building products industry as a whole just intermediate and alleviate supply side constraints and increase housing tech adoption velocity. So the key takeaways when I, before I get into the CES and IBS kind of what 
um, I saw at, at those events. I want to share what I've learned about how to look at product and innovation. So when you look at the, the kind of building supply chain, it is very disaggregated and all over the place. And you, I mean, I could talk ad nauseum about all the different graphics that have been developed around that, but it's not exactly a great system. But I want, I want folks to start thinking about product as the experience. And part of that experience is getting as close to the end user as possible. And that's how you it can explore and identify what that experience should be. So uh, one way I talk about this a lot is uh, through disintermediation. And, and, and some manufacturers or, or, or LBM folks might go, oh my gosh, that's, that's direct to consumer. But it's not really. There are many forms of disintermediation. It's really about removing friction in the channel. And, th and that friction is what slows adoption. The friction and not understanding the alignment and the adoption bell curve. So um, it could be anything from fixing the online experience, fixing the channel, the applicator partners, payment methods, aggregating the products, like for instance, modular, that's a form of disintermediation because it repackages uh, the market and the product and the experience. But none of those physical things are really the product. The product is the experience. And the experience is determined by the go-to-market strategy, whether the experience is good or not good, whether your adoption is fast or not fast, whether someone gets left behind or moves ahead. So this slide uh, breaks down kind of the three funnels I look at the supply chain. We have the materials, the method of construction, and then the market. And those are the things we need to define in order to get uh, the things through the progress of the adoption bell curve as quickly as possible and accurately. So if we go to slide two, it's important to know, or the next slide, yeah, thank you, that's perfect. Um, it's important to know, in order to know where we're going, we kind of need to know where we are. And in order to do that, we need to do research. It's crucial to understand where we are, where our company is, where our targets are, where our products are on the adoption curve. And we look, if you really want some great reading, anything you read on Metcalf's Law and Moore's Law is, is gonna be really good uh, for you and your business. So um, when we think of the adoption alignment, we don't just think of products, we think of companies, we think of builders, we think of applicators, we think of um, new technology. And uh, the analog, when I, when I think of an example of how to think about this is, um, when builders at the beginning of COVID said, oh, we're going to do these, um, we're going to do these uh, online or virtual tours, or we're going to use FaceTime, we're going to use Zoom, it's going to be awesome. And people were saying they're innovating, but were they innovating? The product was not innovative. Now the approach in that space where they live in the adoption curve was innovative for them. So it's important to understand that it's relative. So we need to know kind of where we are and where we want to go and the adoption curve uh, helps us do that it gives us kind of the optics of where we want to go so for like for building products companies they look at the science the method they go to market they experience what that should be and for builders design could be innovation well it has nothing to do with product and uh thanks eric <laughs> disintermediation yeah i know sorry um so the uh it's important to, kind of, to know our place on this. So, and, and also our competitors place. So sometimes you see this on a big wall and people will be mapping things out on it. And that was, that's a really good exercise to go through. And that's something I do So uh, with folks. So um, the CES had plenty of gadgets and a lot of them sure will be completely leapfrog by next year. And IBS, I have no idea what was at IBS uh, because the uh, show floor is pretty much closed. So um, we'll have to wait uh, for that sometime in the next month. But there are a few write-ups that have made things interesting. So some, some things that we've highlight in our, highlighted in our New Home Trends Institute reports recently are around privacy. So there was something at IBS that was written up about uh, by Axis that, that addresses privacy through these uh, smart glass louvers that can be closed or open for airflow and also can go opaque or black depending on the electrical charge. Uh, and then at CES, you had... That was IBS. Now, CES, I was thinking of the aggregation of things like Starlink 
uh, zero mass water, reclaim water treatment, energy storage, waste processing, egg tech. All of these things have a nod to kind of off-grid at scale. That would be completely innovative if you had an off-grid uh, uh, master plan community. So that, that's pretty interesting. So, um, and Schneider Electric actually led the charge a little bit on something new, talking about and dispelling net, a net zero home myths. So it was one of their speeches at CES. And one of the things I really like is that air quality and building science are now much bigger than just like gadgety smart home stuff. It's much more conscientious and thinking about how these inform aesthetics and design and flow um, that is going to be a much bigger part of the story. And of course, there's many, many cool things happening with robotics, uh, blockchain, smart contracts. Those are all things we saw at CES. And you can start to see kind of, it's not just like a, a, va a robo vacuum as an innovation. These are big things that could happen in our industry. And um, one thing I didn't see, I didn't see a lot of modern methods of construction, supply chain innovation, smart cities, virtual smart cities, like what Paul Doherty is doing in China. Um, though we, I think those are really important. But all of these things are to illustrate to think bigger. Think in terms of like Elon Musk just made an announcement that he's going to, he has a fund of $100 million for whoever can come up with a way to safely capture the carbon that we've released. That has got to be like big thinking. So BPM, building products, LBMs, builders, we need to think like that and about those things. Even if we're not an innovative company, we need to be able to see these things coming. And you're vulnerable if we don't see those things coming and if we're a long way from the end user and we don't have things mapped out on the adoption curve. So a vulnerability example is someone called me about uh, 3D printed homes. Actually, I got two calls in the last week about that. Will that affect the kind of traditional commodity goods uh, in the market? Now, I will say props for noticing that and being aware of that and making the call and, and keeping in mind that, oh no, maybe that won't disrupt the commodity business, but keep in mind that's only what you can see. Think about what you're not seeing. Now that's been in the news lots. What are we not seeing? How do we keep an eye on that? So let's go to the next slide and keep, keep in mind that as time goes on, adoption, uh, technology adoption moves much faster. So if you read, if you haven't read Jeff's book, Jeff Booth's book, The Price of Tomorrow, you should. He uses the illustration of folding a piece of paper 50 times. You can't, you can't do that. I tried. But if you could do that, it would reach from here to the moon. And that's how quickly technology adoption is folding on itself over time as time goes on. And that creates deflationary pressure. We get the benefits of that disintermediation techno through technology, uh, increased and improved earning power and um, increased purchasing power. All of those things lead to velocity and adoption. So I encourage you and I implore you in the building product space and the builders, think bigger, read about, think about Metcalf's laws, Moore's laws, think about how that, that announcement Elon Musk made so that's how I think about the future. You can see on this graph, look over time, how quickly things adopted in relation to the past. So, and that is just happening more exponentially every single year. So that's how I see the future compounding um, tech adoption like that folding paper to the moon. So um, on slide four, you can see a little bit about John Burns. We're a consultancy. We get into the, uh, we're in the building, uh, build for rent for sale product. Uh, building products, um, of course, private equity, ma uh, mergers and acquisitions, we do a lot of that. Product development, like right now working on mass timber and modular and market expansion, all those things, including the New Home Trends Institute. And that is about us and kind of our optics on uh, technology adoption. Hey, great. Thank you, everyone, for giving your 30,000 foot views. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I want to make sure we shift gears very quickly and get into the rooms. Um, if you're passionate about the future of housing as we are, these are the topic areas that we have this year. Um, the ones above the line are things we've been talking about for a while um, in earnest and, and kind of at the forefront of, of our focus areas. And the ones below the line we've been talking about a bit more tangentially and as part of our programming um, that have come to the forefront this year. 
Um, if you're interested in any of these areas, you'll uh, take a look at this when you, when you get it from us. We're going to have working groups on each of these topic areas helping drive what we're talking about and the, the experts we're bringing and the programming we're delivering this year. So I'm the best person to reach out to if you're interested in participating.